breaking the wall to collective intelligence. Understanding the geometry of decision-making. Ian Cousin, Max Planck Institute of Animal Behaviour. On November 9th, 1989, I was watching the news on TV with my family. We were profoundly moved by the magnitude of the event. Hi everyone, thanks so much for the invitation to speak today. So I'm going to talk to you about intelligence. Where does intelligence come from? And I've been fascinated by how animal collectives, such as schooling fish, flocking birds, how they encode information within the collective. But we, of course, are a human society that also live fundamentally uh, in a system where interactions create a form of intelligence. And so we often think of the brain as being the seat of intelligence. But it's these interactions that are occurring within meetings like this that also allow us to be cleverer than we otherwise would be. And this type of intelligence is universal throughout nature. And when you see the tight interplay of interactions within animal collectives, you can realize how difficult it's been, how challenging it's been for us to get inside the head of the individual to understand how she behaves. And yet what we've been able to show using computational modeling is that relatively simple and local interactions, avoiding collisions and being attracted to others, is sufficient to explain how these groups self-organize. There doesn't need to be an individual orchestrating the behavior of the others. But now, using AI, which we just heard about, using deep neural networks, we have the capacity, we've developed software that gives us the capacity to track individuals, to reconstruct their visual fields, and even to identify the individuals with no marking required at all. And this can work with termites, as you just saw, with locusts, with rodents. And so it's really a very powerful new tool for example, these Drosophila flies, a human could never recognize them, but the software can. And the hallmark of collective behavior is that information percolates through the system. The change of behavior of one or a few individuals is copied by others and can spread, much how opinions form within human society. And using these new artificial intelligence technologies, we can now reconstruct, we can reconstruct the pathways of photons onto the eyes of the individuals within the group so we can see the world from their perspective and understand how they relate to this complex, time-varying scene. Now, if you're interested in individual intelligence, and neuroscience is a very powerful way of doing this, you can go into the brain and you can look at the physical and functional connectivity. However, when we're looking at animal collectives, the connections between the individuals have no physical form. So again, we need to use AI technologies to reconstruct these hidden networks of interaction. And when we look at these networks, as in our own society, the weightings, the influence that individuals have on one another tends to be weighted and directed. That is, I might be strongly influenced by you, but you not by me. So we have this complex, time-varying network of social communication that has evolved over millennia. And here we are visualizing for the first time this hidden network within a real fish school. And what we've been able to show is that computation is an emergent property of the network as well as within the brains of the individuals. So there's two levels of computation. And we've shown this in a range of different contexts, such as how animals within groups regulate the contagion of information, how they respond to increased risk in their environment. They don't change how their brain perceives the world. What they do is they change the structure of the network, which changes how sensitive the group is to external sensory inputs. We've been able to show that collectives can sense long-range environmental gradients even though no individual in the group can sense the gradient. And this has since also been shown to occur 
within cells, within uh, animals. And importantly, selection, natural selection, is not operating at the level of the collective. These are genetically selfish individuals. And we've been able to show how such collective computation readily evolves under natural selection. So even though the differences to cognition in the brain are obvious, there are also deep similarities. Changing the weighting of the connectedness, changing the network structure, is a way of encoding information. And so when we look at these animal groups, you can think of a fish school or a bird flock really as a fluid computer moving through space, computing things about its environment. And we can show that individuals that have a preference, for example, they may be more experienced than others, or they may know about a food source that others don't know about. They can convey that information via these simple local rules with no signaling, no individual recognition, just using these local interactions and reconciling goal-oriented behavior with social tendency. So here I'm coloring them in white so we can see who is informed, but in this simulation, nobody can explicitly know who has information, yet you can see it was very effectively conveyed. Similarly, we've been able to show that if there's conflict within the group, some want to reach one target, others want to reach another, that without knowing if anyone agrees with you or disagrees with you, just using these local rules, the group can collectively compute and come to a consensus and reach the majority preferred target, even though no individual can count or explicitly vote. They're sort of voting on the move. And so when I first um, wrote about this topic back in 2007, I was quite skeptical that there would genuinely be a deep connection across such different scales of biological organization. But now I know that we can go beyond the metaphor and that there's a deep connection in spatiotemporal computation within the brain and within collectives. So over the last couple of years, I've really been focusing a lot on how do neural collectives make decisions. And I'm interested in general principles that extend from the insect brain, as we see here, that's encoding this vector towards a target, but also in the mammalian brain, where again the brain has to come to a consensus regarding where to move. And so instead of thinking about, well, sort of harnessing the ideas I've developed looking at animal groups, I'm now thinking about neural collectives, about brains moving through space, and how our brain comes to a consensus about what to do. And to study this, it turns out to be quite tricky. And so what we had to do was invent a new technology, which we call holographic virtual reality for freely moving animals. And it's using what's called the anamorphic illusion. And it's such a powerful illusion. I can tell you right now that this tape does not have a volume above the table. It's an illusion that it does. And shortly, you'll see the illusion broken. So it never had the volume. And even if I tell you this, and even though you've seen the illusion broken, when it's put back roughly into the right position, your brain pops it back into 3D space. <laughs> Similarly, this shoe is not actually 3D. So we thought, well, if we can fool a human in this way, surely we can fool animals. So when you typically think of a 3D image on a computer screen, it's rendered in such a way. It's not really 3D. But if you track the camera, which is equivalent of us tracking the eyes of the animal, and then rendering the scene from the animal's perspective, it can move in behind and fully interact with arbitrarily complex virtual environments. And so we've developed this for a range of different systems. I'll show you a few now. Firstly, with fish, with zebrafish. So we use tiny little juvenile zebrafish. It's a model organism. And you can see that the world looks kind of weird to us, but it's always projected such as as if the pillar in this example has a volume, and the fish avoids it, even though there's nothing there, it's just light. And we can also get them to believe that there are virtual fish in the environment, in the tank, swimming with them, even though, again, there's nothing there, it's a hologram, we're just projecting on the surface of the bowl. And yet you can see the real fish in red really believes it to be there. 
Now, we can't put more than one individual into any of our virtual environments, because remember, it can only be from the, you know, as soon as the illusion was broken, uh, you know, it no longer renders rea uh, reality. So you can't have two. But what we can do is we network the systems together so we can have two individuals interacting not in the same physical world, but in the same holographic world, or four individuals inter interacting in the holographic world. And we call this the matrix, for <laughs> similar principle to in the movie. And we've developed virtual environments for flies. We've developed them for plague-forming locusts. And it works extremely well for all of these animals. And so the key question we've been asking is all animals at some point in their lives make decisions on the move. You know, whether you're a monkey, or whether you're a locust. And are there common principles to spatiotemporal computation? So we modeled how the brain behaves, how the brain computes and competes and comes to a consensus. And we found that if we present a brain, a moving brain, with two options, we predict that the animal will spontaneously adopt the average direction, and then the brain will suddenly undergo what's called bifurcation, an emergent transition in neuronal dynamics. But when we looked in the literature, we couldn't find any examples where in people had actually measured how animals move when making decisions. It's almost as if they think movement is the outcome of a decision. But no, movement is changing the sensory re representation, which changes the movement, which changes the sensory representation, and so on. And so we find with flies and locusts clear evidence of the bifurcation. Now, what's really important about the bifurcation is that there's a universal property of any system undergoing this transition, which means at the bifurcation point, it becomes ultra-sensitive to any differences between options. So it's a free property. So even a small error-prone brain can become exceptionally accurate at decision-making. And so we've tested this. So we know that perceived difference between options is important. We know that time taken to decisions is important. But we think we've found a third universal principle, which is that geometry is important. If you start the animal in between the options or far away, we predict that in between the options where the brain can't go through the bifurcation, it can't make good decisions, as shown here. But if the animal can go through the bifurcation in its brain, it amplifies the differences, and the animal can make much more accurate decisions. What about three options? Well, what we found is like most neuroscientists or biologists don't look beyond two because their models don't scale very well. But we found that this model works for any number of options. And for three options, we predict a double bifurcation. The brain is breaking down the complexity of the world into a series of binary decisions that each critical transition it becomes extremely sensitive, even a small noisy brain, to any differences between the remaining options. And indeed, we found strong evidence for this in our flies and our locusts. And I mentioned it works for any number of options. You can see decision-making now between very large numbers of options. And also, I think this is important in biology, there's a deep geometric beauty to these equations and to what the animals are doing. So if this is a general principle, this should also extend to the vertebrate brain. And so here we've tested it in a schooling context where we have two moving targets in space. But again, we predict the brain should exhibit the bifurcation, and we find it. Similarly, for three moving options, we predict a double bifurcation. It looks a bit different now because of the moving frame of reference, but indeed, this is what we find. We've even found that this can help us explain how animals in the wild make decisions, where we can't have controlled conditions. But monkeys, like these, these baboons, frequently have to make decisions together about where to go. They're observing the movements of others. We found tens of thousands of events where some individuals go one way, some go another way, but the collective comes to a consensus regarding where to go. So you'll see in this example, the individuals near the bottom will give up and follow the others. And we can ask of these data collected in the wild whether they also exhibit this bifurcation. And indeed, we find that they do. So we find this to be a powerful universal model of decision making, and that there's a common algorithm that governs decision making in the brain. And also, when we zoom out, 
actually to decision making also within collectives. Natural selection has found the same beautiful solution. Uh, thanks very much.